First Corinthians chapter 3, the first nine verses today. I'll warn you in advance, this is a big boy or a big girl study. It is difficult, but really, really important. Would you read along with me, please? Paul says, brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. That sentence is a tragedy. Paul was with the Corinthians for a year and a half. This letter was written to them from Ephesus on Paul's third missionary journey, which means now many more years have passed. And he says, you're still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there's jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere men? What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned each one his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's building. Father, we just sang it, we need you. Oh God, we need you. This is a message that nobody wants to hear. And yet it's necessary because in order for us to hold on to that which you have held on to us to accomplish, Lord, we need to grow up. We need to become mature. Lord, if we're here and we're not mature, we belong to you, but Well, that's who this message is pointed towards. Have your way, Jesus. May not one man or woman in this final service today keep their hearts or their minds from you. By the power of your Spirit, help us to grow up time for being babies in Christ is done. Lord, if there's anyone in this final service who doesn't know you, if they're not yet born again, I pray that that would change today, that you would reach out to them and ask them to be yours. Offer even now at the beginning, Lord, to forgive their sins. Today is the day they can make that public declaration and we're one person or maybe more closer to that last Gentile. And you can come for your church. We're ready, O God. We love you. We praise you. Lord, let us take this personally that we can cry out to you and grow for your glory. We pray these things in your beautiful name. Amen. On the screen is Baby Huey. Now, I grew up with Baby Huey. If you didn't, well, you're just not as old as I am. But, but every time I think of this Bible study or come to this portion of Scripture, I think of Baby Huey. Now, because I grew up with him when I was small, I thought it was cool. He's this giant baby duck, so much bigger than all of the other characters in the cartoon. But I was looking at that this morning, and honestly, now that I'm older, that just sort of looks creepy. And what's even worse than that is what believers who've been walking with Jesus, people who've given their heart to Jesus some time ago, it's what we look like when we refuse to grow up, when we refuse to mature. Now, as I begin this Bible study today, I realize that nobody likes to be called immature or a baby Christian. 
But understand, there's nothing personal. This is God who's reaching out to you through this passage of study. And the reason he's reaching out is because he wants to change everything. He wants the process of growing to begin today. Again, baby Huey looks pretty creepy. But imagine what you'd look like as a Christian with a figurative diaper on because you just didn't do the work or because you just weren't motivated to find out who he is. Well, our study today is all about not only learning more about who he is, being honest about who we are, but doing so so that we can grow to become more like him in our pursuit of becoming like Jesus and serving him for his glory. Paul begins verse 1 by saying, Brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly, mere infants in Christ. If you have a King James, it uses the word carnal instead of worldly. Carnal simply means flesh. Now I'm going to read this verse in the Living Bible, not really a translation, more of a paraphrase. And I'm going to do it because I love the vividness of this. Listen now to the Living Bible. Read this verse. It says, Dear brothers, I've been talking to you as though you were still just babies in Christ, in the Christian life, who are not following the Lord, but your own desires. I cannot talk to you as I would to healthy Christians who are filled with the Spirit. Now, the reason I like the vividness of that is because sort of the penalty for not walking in the Spirit is set before us. I I want to talk to you as though you were mature. I have so much more for you, but I can't talk to you that way because you're sort of disqualified because of the way that you're living your life. Now, make no mistake, whenever we remain in immaturity in our walk with Jesus, it's because of flesh. It's just because of flesh. We, we give in to what we want or what we feel or the circumstances around us instead of trusting the Lord. Paul says all of that is carnality or walking in an immature Christian faith. Now, while he addresses the church at Corinth, please note that the first word in verse 1 is brothers. There has been a centuries-old debate about whether There could be carnal Christians, or if they're carnal, are they really Christians? And others would say, well, no, surely they can't be saved. They're just going through the motions. But, but, But Paul is addressing these Corinthians as brothers, and I would add sisters in the Lord. And that means clearly that there are carnal Christians sitting with mature Christians, immature believers sitting amongst mature believers in every church, including ours, every time the doors are open. And the reality is that we can't always tell which is which. They look alike. Jesus in the parable of the wheat and tares. Wheat and tares look exactly the same until you get really close and inspect them. Well, Jesus said, you know, an enemy has planted tares among the wheat. And his servant said, well, do you want us to go rip out the tares? And he said, no, if you rip out the tares, you may get some of the wheat by mistake. All of that means is that there are carnal Christians or immature Christians who sometimes look more mature than they are. And it also means there are some who appear to be mature Christians who aren't really Christians at all. Jesus said, let's leave them for the harvesting angels at the end of the age. That's how we're going to find out. So today isn't about other people. It's not about your husband. It's not about your wife. It's not about the people that you came to church with or other people in the other room. This isn't about first service or second service. Today is all about you. Because what Jesus is going to do, what the Holy Spirit is going to do in you, is to convict you of sin. Now, I told the other services, Paula is strange about some things. And this is one of the things she's strange about. She says often, she will say, I love conviction. And I have to say, well, I I don't. I like to walk with Jesus. I like to enjoy my walk. And and conviction to me is almost failure. Now, I understand I'm forgiven. I understand that I can repent. I, I understand that I want you to understand all of that today. But today is a day I promise you you're going to be convicted. And what you do with that conviction is going to determine whether or not you're a mature or an immature Christian. I repeat, no one likes to be called a baby Christian. I get that. 
But this is one of those important if the shoe fits moments where you've got to be real with the Lord and where you've got to say, okay, Jesus, I- I'm tired of being a baby Christian. I want to grow the same author in his letters to the Colossians and to the Ephesians. These beautiful prayers. Consistent in both places is his prayer that he prays that you will grow in the knowledge of God and in the knowledge of God's will for your life. Those two things can't possibly occur in the life of an immature Christian. This is one of those places where if you are immature and will confess it, repent of it, then you will begin today to grow in the knowledge of who God is. I love to know who he is. I love to know more about him. The songs that we sing are so rich in lyric. That's because that's who God is. That's the God that we can cry out, God, I need you. Oh, how I need you. But you got to know who he is. You got to know his character. You got to know what he expects. And you got to know how good he is. And you got to trust. And then the Subsequent is to grow in the knowledge of God's will for your life. There isn't one person in this room who doesn't want to know what God's will is. Some of us might be a little afraid of it, but that's okay because a mature Christian is going to say, but God, I trust you and I want to know and I want to walk in the middle of your perfect, pleasing and acceptable will. This is written to believers. And if you're honest enough today to admit that you are a little on the immature side or maybe a lot on the immature side, This can be a life-changing moment for all of you. They are brothers in Christ. He says this in verse 2. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Now I repeat, he was with the church in Corinth for a year and a half. Only Ephesus did Paul stay longer. He was there for a little more than three years. But a year and a half, he would sit with them. He would teach them. He would pastor them. He would instruct them. He would example his life before their very eyes. They knew better. Now, in a year and a half, it's not likely anybody's going to become like super mature Christian. But in a year and a half, they can certainly begin to grow. You know, if we look around at our physical world, we can sort of tell just by what people eat what their level of maturity is. We see babies and we know that they're going to be breastfed or they're going to drink formula. And we can look at just what they say, yeah, that's for a baby. We can look at our kids, especially the little ones. And we can tell by the snacks that we give them in our toddler church. We will give them like little Cheerios. I get hungry sometimes. I go get a handful of Cheerios and, and eat them. But we know that's not like grown-up food. We grown-ups, we probably proved it this past Thursday. We like solid food. We want to eat. I could almost see Sam mouth-watering, talking about the turkey that Don made. We want to eat. Well, the same thing is true for a believer. The immature believer is happy with their our daily bread. The immature believer will, will take five minutes of devotion time in the morning and think, well, I've been with Jesus. We'll, we'll, we'll pray over meals. But we're really not digging in. And the whole point of this study today is that solid food is available to make you strong spiritually and emotionally. Those two are connected. And all you have to do is dig in and eat it. What kind of food spiritually have you been eating? Again, is your commitment to studying God's word limited to morning devotions? I was telling the other services, I hate the term. I mean, it's an appropriate term. Devotion means surrendering heart, you know, worshiping. But, but we've turned devotions into five minutes in the morning with Jesus. Is that really your time with the Lord? What about your prayer time? I'm going to talk about prayer time at the end of the study today. What about your prayer time? Is the bulk of your prayer before you eat a meal? Lord, bless this food. Or do you really engage in mature conversation with the Lord? Do you pour your heart out to him? What about your time serving the Lord? You know, one of the things about a church is we come and we're all part of one another. Are you serving? 
Again, I'll talk more about that at the end of the study as well. But but you've got to be, a, to be mature, you've got to be a man or woman who puts others' needs ahead of your own. And these are the questions that the Holy Spirit is going to be asking all study long. And as we balance our walk with the Lord, we remember that it's, it's more than just the Word. The Word has great value, but it has actually very little value if, in fact, you're not doing what it says. Church has great value, but unless you're serving your church, your walk is not balanced at all. If your fellowship with other believers isn't centered on and focused on Jesus, then it's just people hanging out. So mature Christians have balance in their walk with the Lord. If you have a balanced spiritual diet, the result will be maturity. But without balance, if you're still on the immature side, these next words are directly for you. He says, indeed, you're still not ready. Now, I know I mentioned this at the very beginning when I read the passage, but I wanted to sink in. Paul was with him a year and a half. This is his third missionary journey. So now, more than six or seven years has passed. And he has to say, indeed, you're still not ready. I got to tell you, that breaks a pastor's heart. When I see people in the church who have been here for years and years and years, and there's no depth to their walk. You know, their understanding of Bible verses is limited to those that they have on their plaques or their refrigerator magnets at home. When they're still asking questions like, well, it says somewhere in the Bible like, or where is it in the Bible that, and and they don't really have the answers and they're not really digging in. You see, those are indications not only of a lack of maturity, but, 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 The truth is that you're not ready for solid food. And he has to say, this man who loves these people, this man who founded this church, he has to say to them, you're still not ready. I can't tell you how many times in counseling that I've sat with people who've been in our church for years and years and years, and they're still dealing with the same problems that we were dealing with five years or ten years earlier. Pastor Ron, I need counseling. Well, 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 why? You haven't done what I told you to do yet. That's a sign of immaturity. Again, where is your walk with the Lord? Mature or immature? He says you're still worldly, for since there's jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? Another sign of immaturity in the church is people that sort of strive. You know, there's always people looking for people to argue with or debate with. This whole idea of striving, check your social media content. Why is it we like to argue? Why is it that we avoid the unity of the, of the spirit? And instead we want our opinion and we want to challenge people who disagree with our opinion. And then we get in sort of these arguments. Why is it that we pick sides? You know, in our church culture, unfortunately, we have... A, a tendency to identify with successful pastors or big churches or even worse, successful or famous people. And we find out somebody famous became a believer. We want to go to that church. Thinking about Justin Bieber, who, by the way, appears to have really given his life to Jesus Christ. Pray for him. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing, but, but people are putting him on a pedestal. Why is it that when Kanye West started having concerts and those worship things that he was doing, and again, he appears to be another one who's truly given his life to Jesus Christ. Why is it that people won't go to church? Tens of thousands of people would go to these impromptu celebrations that he would put up in different cities. Churches would be empty, but Kanye West, he'd have a full house. Why? It's because of our immaturity. We have a tendency to look at people rather than looking at the one who's responsible for the people, Jesus. Are you not acting like mere men? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere men? What, after all, is Apollos, and what is Paul? 
And here's the answer. Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed. Apollos watered it. But God made it grow. When I was preparing for this study uh, for the last couple of weeks, th- this, this verse, I planted the seed and Apollos watered it, kept really hitting my heart. You know, I have the privilege of being the founding pastor of Calvary Chapel of San Antonio. We've been here for 25 years. We started from absolutely nothing. And I got to tell you, there's something thrilling about planting a foundation. To watch people's lives change. You guys have made my life so rich and so full and so joyful. Because I get to watch what God is doing in your lives for those of you who will let God have his way in your heart. To say that I planted this church, but there are others who water it, is a good thing, not a bad thing. I love the fact that when I go out of town or when something comes up, I've got a whole bunch of men here that can water what I planted. There's no jealousy. There's no competition. I love the fact that when we're out of town and I know somebody else is teaching here, no matter whether it's Sunday or Wednesday or Friday, I love the fact that I know almost as soon as that man is done teaching, my phone is going to start ringing or Paul is going to start getting texts telling us how well they did and how proud of them I ought to be. Those are good things. But here's the thing that we all of us need to remember, that we are only servants. Nothing more and nothing less. We have to remember that whatever good that's happened in this church, in any church, the good that's happened in your lives, the only one responsible for that good is Jesus himself. Not you, not the church that you belong to, but Christ himself, Christ in us, the hope of glory. And when we understand that, then we understand our role as servants. Remember that word for the end of our Bible study. We are only servants, Paul and Apollos, only servants. Now, there is no indication whatsoever that there's any animosity or competition between Paul or Apollos. And we can go back to chapter 1 when he also includes Peter. Some say, well, I am of Peter. There's no competition. They're all doing what they've been gifted by God to do. And they're doing it the right time. They're doing it with the right heart. And they're doing it the right way. And the result is people are to be growing. But all of a sudden, in Corinth, we've got these people saying, no, 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 I follow Paul, and I follow Apollos. And Paul is simply saying, that's the sign of what I would call a baby Huey Christian. When we understand that, then God alone gets the glory. And he says, so neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything. Sometimes, we pastors and I hope not yours, but there have been times when we stop remembering that we're not anything at all. Each was a assigned task. Every job in the body of Christ, every gift given by God has equal value to him. Next week in our study, we're going to go to the Bema seat. We're going to talk about rewards received and rewards lost in heaven. And whatever God's called you to do, if you do it well, if you do it with all of your heart, if you do it with the right motive, well, then you're going to get the same reward that I would, even though I might have the microphone in the public platform, you're going to get exactly the same reward that I get for doing what I do with the right heart and with the right motive. And too often we sort of think we've become something or we've arrived or we deserve something more. And when we find ourselves in that place, it's a dangerous place to be because it indicates that we are an immature Christian. And the most immature Christian of all is the Christian who thinks that he or she is mature. Paul's saying, neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose and each will be rewarded according to their own labor. Imagine for a moment Jesus handing you a crown of righteousness. 
or he examines your heart and says, well, I was with you when you were doing this and I was so proud of you. You blessed me so much. And he says, it pleases me to give you this crown. Now we're going to throw the crowns down at his feet. But we don't want to be empty-handed when that happens. Each one of us will receive our reward according to our own labor, not what anybody else does. It doesn't matter what anybody else is doing, what God's assigned anybody else. This is, as I said at the beginning, only about you and your work for the Lord. And then he closes this section by saying, for we're God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. Now we should take great pride, a godly pride in that last verse. We're God's fellow workers Imagine that. Jesus says, I choose you. We're God's field. We're the ones who are spread out to bring in the harvest. In these last hours of these last days, we're the ones with responsibility of scattering seed, the word of God, everywhere we go. We get that privilege, and we are God's building. You know, sometimes we forget that we are the church, Again, in the West, we've got this mentality that says we come to church when the reality is that we are the church. Every one of you is sitting in a strip mall. There's nothing holy about this place until you come in. And when you come in, can you imagine Jesus in heaven just going, oh, there's my building. That's in the active aorist tense. He's continuing to build, and he's building you, and he's building me in here. And he claims us. He owns us. And the mature believer embraces that and says, okay, Lord, I'm your servant. Use me however you will. The immature Christian says, well, I can't really be used, or I don't have enough time. Or who am I to serve God? Well, what I want to do as I finish today, I want to talk about signs of an immature believer. This is not a comprehensive list. But these are the things that God put on my heart today for Calvary Chapel of San Antonio. I'm going to give you eight signs of an immature believer. Please let the Lord speak to your heart. Don't shut him out. Don't figure it's okay. He understands. This is a moment of truth, a moment where everything can change for you in an instant. But you've got to hear the Spirit speaking just to you. Again, it's not about the person you're with. It's not about anything or anyone else. This is just your private time with the Holy Spirit. The first evidence that you are an immature believer is if there has been little or no change in you and in your circumstances since you believed. Again, there's carnal Christians. Paul is addressing them. But if you haven't changed, if the environment around you hasn't changed, very much or at all, then you're an immature Christian. Let's bring this really, really close to home. How, how have things changed in your homes? Has your marriage grown? Has your marriage prospered? Are you still yelling at each other? Are you still using foul language? Do you still get angry? Men, would your wife and kids describe you as being kind and gentle? You see, if you're an unbeliever, then, then that's just the way it is. But if as a believer, you haven't grown out of that. You know, love keeps no record of wrongs. We're going to read that in the 13th chapter of this book. If you're still holding on to the way you used to be, well, I can't help it, I've got a temper, she just drives me crazy or he drives me crazy, that's a sign of an immature believer. If you go to work, and you haven't changed, and you still get involved in all of the ugly talk, still using foul language, still listening to dirty jokes and laughing at them, 
sharing with your coworkers in the sin that they were involved in during the week, if those things haven't changed and you're an immature Christian, a baby, and God wants to fix that today, he wants you to resolve, God, I'm sorry, help me, and he'll do that today. We cannot stay who we were if you're still hanging around the same people. Unbelievers, if you're still getting involved in the things that they do, you're an immature Christian. A lot of us had family with us over Thanksgiving. If that family is unsaved and you start reverting to the unsaved you because they're around, you're an immature Christian. God's saying, no, 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 I want there to be light. You're my light. And you say, no, I refuse to shine because I don't want to make anybody uncomfortable. These are questions that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you directly about. And the only thing you can do is to provide an honest answer. The second indication that you're an immature Christian is found in your prayer life. And specifically in the pronouns that you use. If they're personal pronouns, I, me, my, then you're an immature Christian. Your prayers ought to be a lot more about other people than about you. If you are f- the focus of your prayers, that's immaturity. Now we can all measure, I mean, realistically, practically, we can measure where our prayers are. Every one of you carries around a recording device, makes recording things real easy. I'm going to challenge you to record your prayers so that you can hear with your own ears whether or not you're mature or immature. Lord, give me this. Lord, I need this. Lord, I can't believe this is happening to me. Why did you let this happen? That's immaturity. If your prayers are about other people, if your prayers are for other people, then that's a sign of maturity. If your prayer life is just sort of casual, I call them flare prayers. Oh, God, help. God, get me out of this. That's a sign of immaturity. Men, I would add for you, if you're not praying with your wife, for your wife, and then the two of you with your children, then that's a sign of immaturity. You are an immature Christian if prayer is difficult for you. Now I know people say all the time, Pastor, you don't understand, I don't have time. If you don't have time to talk to Jesus, you're busier than he wants you to be. Your priorities are off. That is a sign of immaturity. Listen to your prayers. Now, don't perform for the recording. Just be normal. Just pray what's in your heart. And however short or however long, listen to your own words and you decide whether you're mature or immature. The third, and this will hurt some of you, you're an immature Christian if you're easily offended. If you're easily offended, if, if somebody looks at you the wrong way or you're having a bad day and they didn't say something the way you want them to say it and, and you get angry at them, that's, that's a sign of immaturity. Remember, we are to be peacemakers as Christians. Blessed, happy are the peacemakers. And so we've got to be looking to embrace people, not to push them away, because we're having a bad day. What's going on in your life should have no bearing whatsoever on the way you treat other people. So if you are easily offended, it's usually because you're looking to be offended. Have you ever heard somebody say something like this? You know, I know unbelievers that treat me better than Christians do or the people in church do. Not true. Because the unbelievers are going to let you keep sinning 
don't be easily offended. You've got to get over yourself. When you get over you, then God is free to take over. And when he's free to take over, he will do marvelous things if you give him the opportunity. The fourth area, this is another hard one. You are an immature Christian if you are resistant to submission. If you're resistant to submission. Now, that's a plug for my Friday night study in Ephesians chapter 5. I'm going to do only one verse. Verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for or the fear of God, depending on your translation. If you're resistant to this idea of submission, then you've got faith problems, which indicates how immature you really are. Now, I know nobody likes to submit. But you see, when we do submit, we do it for Jesus, well, then there's great joy and there's great reward. We submit to our bosses. We submit to governing authorities. Drives us crazy, but we do it. But how we do it determines whether or not we're mature or immature. Ladies, if you're unwilling to submit to your husband's leadership, it's a faith issue. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. If you're not pleasing God, then that defines pretty well immaturity. You don't have faith in your husband that he's going to make the right choices. But your faith is in God. God, if I do what you tell me to do, then you got me and I'm okay. Jesus said about the Roman centurion, speaking to his own Jewish disciples, he said, I've not found such great faith in all of Israel. Can you imagine what a slap in the face that was to Peter and James and the other disciples? But you see, the Roman centurion, because he recognized the authority of Jesus, no, you don't have to come to my house. You say the word, and they'll be healed. And Jesus, I, I just picture him stroking his beard, saying, man, I've not found such great faith in that in a Gentile. Ladies, I understand how difficult it is to submit to your husbands, because I know most of them. But I can tell you, Jesus will stand for you and with you and smile upon you if you do it. You're an immature Christian if you are resistant to submission. Fifth, you're an immature Christian if you blame others for the condition of your life. If you blame others, it's my parents' fault. A lot of us weren't blessed to have the greatest parents in the world. But the reality is who they were or what they did did or are doing continually has no bearing at all on the rest of your life. And we blame others. Well, well, my husband cheated on me. My wife left me. And we can get so angry that we blame them. It's not fair I didn't get that job. It's not fair that I'm in this situation. An immature Christian is the one who blames others for the condition of of or the circumstances surrounding their lives. There is not one more minute of one more day that has to be affected or influenced by anything anyone else did to you in your past. If you'll just let it go and let Jesus take control of your life. The mature Christian moves forward. The immature Christian stays put. And they're staying put in a very unhealthy place, a place where the Holy Spirit is absent because there's no power. An immature Christian blames others. Sixth, the immature Christian is a victim of bad doctrine. Now, I could go on for hours in this, and I can't, obviously. But doctrine matters. Doctrine is a foundation upon which we can stand. Paul says over and over, stand firm or be ye immovable. I love the poetic value of the King James. Be ye immovable. I love that word picture. But if you don't have solid doctrine, then you can't be immovable. The immature believer 
It's always looking for miracles, always looking for God to do something. God, why did you let this happen? Why don't you change this? God, fix this. The mature believer says, along with Job, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. And we understand that. We don't expect God to do everything for us. We walk in his will and then the blessings of God follow us for sure. But you won't know that unless you have solid doctrine. And the reason we don't have solid doctrine is because we don't study our Bibles. To grow in the grace and knowledge of God, you've got to study your Bible to know who he is and what he's done. The Corinthians, all of the great teaching that the Apostle Paul gave them effectively has no value all these years later. I realize we're not all called to be Bible teachers. We're not all called to be theologians. But we are all called to grow in the knowledge of who he is. That takes work. It doesn't just happen. It's not putting Christian bumper stickers on your car or plaques in your home. It's sitting down with your Bible open expecting God to teach you more about Him. I say all the time I want to be more like Jesus tomorrow than I am today. That takes work. It takes commitment. It takes resolve. It takes personal discipline. Immature Christians are undisciplined. And they're going to get carried away with every wind and wave of doctrine. And they're going to be deeply disappointed in the end. Number seven. The immature Christian has very little involvement in church. Now they go to church. But they sort of sit, they listen, they get up, they go. And we have to decide... If that's a sign of an immature Christian, well, why are we in that group? I got to tell you, earlier I talked about each one has our own role and every role is as important as the next role. Why would any of us ever believe for a moment that it's okay just to come to church rather than be a part of the church? We got to serve others. John chapter 13, Jesus washed the feet of his disciples starting with the dirty feet of the betrayer. And he said, I've done this as an example that you go and do likewise. Where and when, over the 2,000 years since Christ, where and when did it become fashionable just to go to church and think that's doing anything for Jesus? We come here to be equipped to do the work of ministry. And we're equipped to do the work of ministry by knowing Him. And if you know Him, then you know it's got to be about others. Whatever you've been through, there's somebody in this church going through it right now. They need you. We have this magnificent diversity in this church, diversity of age, diversity of economic background, diversity of race and ethnicity and, and, and cultural identity. We, we've got that kind of diversity. And there's people here who need you. So honestly, and this is as candid as I can be, if you're not serving in this church, you're an immature Christian. And I've heard all the reasons why, well, Pastor Sunday's my only day off. We get to church, but then we got things we got to do. Or it's my only time with family. There's no better time to serve than serving with your family. We have multiple services for that reason. And every one of you ought to be sitting one service and serving at least one. You mean be at church for like three or four hours? Yeah. If you're not committed, if you're not invested in your church body, then you are an immature Christian. Remember, serving others is the reason that we have the Holy Spirit. And finally, and this is another one that will hurt, the immature Christian 
is the man or the woman who holds on to unforgiveness. Now remember the word carnal at the beginning. Worldly in the NIV, carnal in the King James. There's nothing more carnal. The word carnal means flesh. There's nothing more carnal than wanting revenge on somebody who's hurt you. When God says instead forgive. Instead forgive. But, but you don't know how badly they hurt me. You don't know how my whole life changed because of what they did to me. It doesn't matter. What they did to you isn't nearly as bad as what you've done to Christ. Let those words ring in your ears and in your heart over and over and over. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. If you can learn to forgive, it doesn't mean people are getting off the hook. God's still going to deal with them. But it means you will be free. If you can learn to forgive, it means that you will no longer be bound or burdened by that person that you're holding unforgiveness toward. Now, practically, there's only one way I know to do this. My flesh is just like your flesh. If somebody does something bad to me, my flesh wants to do worse to them. But you see, you die to flesh and do that by praying. And you do it by praying for the people who've hurt you. You may have to pray through clenched teeth. Bless them, Lord. But I promise you, God will begin to change your heart. But you have to make a commitment to continue to pray for them. You've got to accept the fact that God loves them as much as he loves you. And that's a requirement then for us to forgive them. It doesn't mean you've got to be best friends with them. It doesn't mean that you've got to room with them at the next retreat. But what it means is that you've got to be unencumbered by unforgiveness. The immature Christian holds on to his or her right to be unforgiving. God wants to change all of that and he wants to do it today. We're going through, as you all know, a really difficult time in the world that we live in where all of the circumstances around us tend to lead to hopelessness. We can let fear overwhelm us. The enemy's always looking to devour immature Christians, and he does a pretty good job. God has a plan for your life that all of these signs of immaturity are inhibiting you from doing for his glory. And once again, we'll see how important that is in our study next week. We talk about the rewards that God wants to give you. But for now, are you mature or immature? And if you're immature and will confess that to the Lord, then everything about your life changes the minute you leave this room. You'll no longer look like creepy baby Huey, spiritually speaking. You'll be that man or that woman who really is the light of God, a man or a woman that others will see, and they'll say, you know what? I want my faith to be as strong as theirs. I want to be like them. I want their joy. I, I want my family to be like their family. I want my marriage to be like their marriage. And God will do the work. Remember, God does all the work. Well, each and every one of us can plant a few seeds and water those seeds and suddenly we can be no longer immature. But we can be that Christian that other people look at and say, I'm going to follow them because they're following Jesus. The only thing you've got to provide now is honesty. It's just you and Jesus. So why don't we pray? Father, as we finish our studies this morning, I acknowledge indeed these were for 
big boys and big girls in Christ. 